Hey friend, welcome back to the YouTube channel for the Renaissance English History Podcast. I am your host, Heather. This is an audio mini course preview. So patrons of the podcast, members on YouTube get audio mini courses every month, depending on what, what level you come in at. And back in January, it was on the Wars of the Roses. That was the audio mini course. An overview, introduction to the Wars of the Roses. And this is the first lesson, the introductory lesson that I am just sharing with you today. You can get all of the courses by becoming a patron at a certain level or joining the YouTube channel. Again, at I think it's PARS patron level or above. Or you can actually just go on and buy the courses on my course page as well if you would like to do that. But for the purposes of this episode, this is an introduction to the Wars of the Roses, which of course is the foundational event of our Tudor period, also led to a lot of the anxiety that Henry VIII had over the lack of a male heir because he did not want England to go back to a period of the Wars of the Roses. So... Enjoy this introductory lesson. If you want to purchase the course, you can do so at my courses page, which is courses.heathertesco.com. I'll put a link below as well. Or you can join patreon.com uh, slash englandcast, or just join this YouTube channel as well at the uh, appropriate level to get the free courses. And every month you get a free audio mini course, usually five or six different segments, like an hour and a half or so long. Um, so thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoy this introduction to the Wars of the Roses, and I will talk to you soon. Bye. Hello, friend, and welcome to this Wars of the Roses audio course. I'm your host, Heather. I have been podcasting on Tudor England since 2009. I love to do audio courses. I've done several, including one on kick-ass Tudor women. I've done one on pregnancy and childbirth in Tudor England. And I'm doing more of them now because I love to do them. For some of you, this was a bonus because you support me at a certain level on my YouTube channel or through Patreon. Thank you so very, very much for that support. For others of you, you just signed up and got this course, and I would love, love, love to know what drew you to it. Did you already have some knowledge of the Wars of the Roses? Are you completely new to this? What do you hope to get out of it? Pop into the community and let me know. There's links to the community uh, in the handouts, and there should be links in the notes for this audio as well. I cannot wait to hear what drew you to this and to get to know you a little bit better. So the Wars of the Roses, a series of intermittent conflicts that tore through England in the second half of the 15th century, stands as one of the most tumultuous and transformative periods in English history. This period was marked by a fierce struggle for the throne between two branches of the Plantagenet family, the houses of Lancaster and York, and they reshaped the landscape of English politics, monarchy, and society. The name Wars of the Roses stems from the emblems associated with the two houses, the Red Rose of Lancaster and the White Rose of York. The roots of this conflict lay deep in the historical soil of England's past, entwined with the complexities of feudal loyalties, the decline of chivalric ideals, and the burgeoning sense of Renaissance individualism. It began in a time when the long-held feudal structures were being challenged by the emergence of a more central state, and the traditional bounds of loyalty and service were increasingly strained by the ambitions and desires of powerful nobles. The Wars of the Roses were not a continuous military campaign, but rather a series of sporadic yet brutal battles, skirmishes, and power plays that occurred between 1455 and 1485. The immediate 
cause of the conflict was the mental instability and weak leadership of King Henry VI of Lancaster, which created a power vacuum that ambitious nobles were eager to fill. Richard, the Duke of York, emerged as a leading contender, not just as a regent to the ailing king, but as a potential monarch himself, given his own plausible claim to the throne. This period was characterized by its unpredictability and the shifting fortunes of war. Battles such as St. Albans, Towton, Barnet, and Tewkesbury were not only remarkable for their ferocity, but also for how they abruptly altered the balance of power. The conflict saw the rise of significant figures like Queen Margaret of Anjou, Edward IV, Richard III, and eventually Henry Tudor, who would end the Wars of the Roses and inaugurate the Tudor dynasty. The Wars of the Roses were significant for several reasons. First, they marked the end of the medieval period in England and paved the way for the Renaissance and the modern age. The wars disrupted the old feudal order and saw the rise of a new social and political landscape with increased power concentrated in the hands of the monarchy and a new understanding of kingship and governance. Second, the conflict resulted in significant dynastic change, culminating in the rise of the Tudor dynasty. The Plantagenets had ruled for 300 years or so, and the Tudors, starting with Henry VII, would go on to reign for over a century overseeing a period of considerable political, cultural, and religious transformation in England. The Wars of the Roses also had a profound impact on the collective English consciousness, the tales of betrayal, the shifting alliances, the dramatic battles, and the colorful personalities involved have captured the imagination of generations. They have been immortalized in literature, most notably by Shakespeare, and they continue to be a subject of fascination in popular culture. So the Wars of the Roses were more than just a series of battles for the English crown. They were a complex and pivotal chapter in English history that reshaped the nation's political landscape, influenced the course of the monarchy, and left an indelible mark on the cultural and historic consciousness of England. As we dive into the intricate details of this period, we will uncover not just the stories of kings and queens, but also insights into the changing fabric of a nation on the brink of the modern world. Let's start now with Section 1, the historical backdrop. Part 1, The Hundred Years' War and its Aftermath. The story of the Wars of the Roses cannot be told without first understanding the profound impact of the Hundred Years' War, which went on from 1337 to 1453 on England. This prolonged conflict with France stretched over a century, draining English resources, altering national identity, and setting the stage for internal strife. The war began as a dynastic dispute over the French throne, with successive English kings asserting their claim. It evolved into a series of intermittent conflicts that had far-reaching consequences for both nations. During the early phases, the English experienced notable successes with victories at Crecy in 1346 and Agincourt in 1415 under the leadership of Edward III and Henry V, respectively. These battles became legendary, celebrated for the valor of the English longbowmen and the martial prowess of their kings. However, these triumphs did not translate into lasting political gains. The war's later stages saw a reversal of fortune as the French, inspired by figures like Joan of Arc, began to reclaim their territories. By the time the war concluded in 1453, England had lost virtually all of its possessions in France except Calais. The financial and human costs of the war were enormous. The burden of financing these campaigns fell heavily on the shoulders of the English nobility and the peasantry, 
leading to increased taxation and social unrest. The loss of prestige and territory, especially under the rule of the less militarily competent Henry VI, contributed to a sense of national humiliation and dissatisfaction among the nobility who had invested heavily in the war both financially and emotionally. The House of Lancaster's decline is intrinsically linked to the weakening of the English position in the Hundred Years' War. Henry VI, unlike his father Henry V, was not a warrior king. His reign, beginning in 1422, was marked by a series of misfortunes and missteps. Henry's bouts of mental illness left him incapacitated for long periods and created a power vacuum and exacerbated the instability in England. Henry's inability to effectively govern was compounded by the loss of English territories in France, which undermined his authority and his prestige. These losses were not just territorial, but also symbolic, tearing at the very fabric of the Lancastrian claim to legitimacy, which was partly built on the successes of Henry V in France. The discontent among the nobility who had expected to reap rewards from the war was palpable. The weak leadership of Henry VI and the consequent decline of Lancastrian authority created a breeding ground for dissent. Nobles dissatisfied with the king's rule began to look elsewhere for leadership, setting the stage for the rise of the House of York. This internal dissent in the nobility was a crucial precursor to the outbreak of the Wars of the Roses. Now let's talk about the social and economic conditions of 15th century England. The social and economic landscape of 15th century England was marked by significant change and upheaval. The impact of the Hundred Years' War was felt not just in the corridors of power, but also in the fields and the marketplaces of England. The war had drained the royal treasury, leading to increased taxation and economic hardship for many. The peasantry, already burdened by feudal obligations, faced additional strains, which occasionally erupted into rebellion, most notably the Peasants' Revolt of 1381. The decline of feudalism was also becoming evident, The traditional feudal bonds that had held society together were weakening, giving way to a more individualistic and profit-oriented mindset. This shift was partly driven by the changing nature of warfare, which now required more professional armies rather than feudal levies, and partly by the emergence of a more money-based economy. These social and economic changes set the stage for the political turmoil of the Wars of the Roses. The nobility, seeking to protect their interests in an ever-changing world, became increasingly involved in the power struggles at the heart of English politics. The combination of a weakened monarchy, a disgruntled nobility, and a restless population created a volatile mix that would soon ignite into the Wars of the Roses. Part 2. Deepening Tensions and Emerging Conflicts The Economic Aftermath of the Hundred Years' War The end of the Hundred Years' War did not bring about peace and prosperity as might have been hoped. Instead, England faced severe economic challenges. The cost of the war had been immense, leading to significant national debt and rampant inflation. The government's efforts to raise funds through taxation were met with resistance and resentment, particularly among already overburdened peasantry and the emerging merchant class. The war also disrupted trade routes, particularly with the key wool markets in Flanders, which were vital to England's economy. The economic downturn had a ripple effect through the country, leading to increased unemployment and social discontent. The disbanding of armies meant that many soldiers trained for war and without livelihoods added to the social unrest. These economic hardships provided fertile ground for political unrest as different factions sought to capitalize on the widespread dissatisfaction. 
The nobility played a crucial role in the lead-up to the Wars of the Roses. With the king's authority weakened, powerful noble families such as the Nevilles and the Percys in the north and the Beauforts in the south started asserting more independence, often clashing with each other over land and influence. These rivalries were exacerbated by the king's inability to effectively manage these disputes. Furthermore, the loss of lands in France meant that many nobles who had claims or possessions there now focused their ambitions on England. The shift intensified the competition and rivalry among the noble families. The nobility's increasing involvement in governance, often filling in for the king's deficiencies, led to a power struggle that was as much about personal gain as it was about national stability. The House of Lancaster's decline was not due just to Henry VI's personal failings, but also broader issues within the family. There was a lack of strong, unifying leadership, which led to internal divisions and weakened the House's position against external threats. The Lancastrian hold on the throne, which had always been somewhat tenuous due to its origins in a usurpation, which was Henry IV's overthrow of Richard II, was further weakened by these internal conflicts and lack of clear succession planning. Social and economic conditions in 15th century England were not just a backdrop to the political drama, but were active elements in the unfolding of the Wars of the Roses. The peasantry, long the backbone of feudal society, was increasingly restive under the dual pressures of feudal obligations and rising taxes. The repeated outbreaks of plague had reduced the population leading to labor shortages and a subsequent shift in the economic power dynamics between the nobility and the peasantry. Moreover, the rise of a more conscious and literate middle class, particularly in urban areas, began to change the social fabric. This emerging class, though not directly involved in the noble power struggles, influenced public opinion and could be a source of support or dissent. The historical backdrop of the Wars of the Roses reveals a complex tapestry of economic hardship, social change, political ambition, and dynastic rivalry. These factors interwove to create a volatile and uncertain period in England, a country that was ripe for the outbreak of a civil war that would dramatically alter its course. Next, we're going to talk about the key figures and families who were playing the lead roles in these events that led to the Wars of the Roses and we'll also get insights into the transformation of medieval England, cusp of the modern era. Thank you so much for listening to section one. Tune in for the next section, section two, we'll talk about key figures and families. And we'll see you there. Blow northern wind, ascend for baby sweating. Blow northern wind. Ich